do this. Hi, I'm Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming up soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions. So start thinking about them now and you can put them in the Zoom chat. Um, so just type them um, on the bottom right hand corner of the screen and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep hosting more of them, please buy books from us. Throughout the evening, I'll post links in the chat to buy a copy of Something Unbelievable from McNally Jackson. Um, and in the New York Times this morning, Rachel Kong writes that with Something Unbelievable, Maria Kuznetsova movingly makes a case for the significance of the everyday. The book calls attention to the fact that human beings live through extraordinary circumstances are still, well, human beings. They hold grudges, they're petty, and they fall in love with the wrong people, whether they're fleeing a war or staying at home with a baby. The book argues that the mundane moments are what make a life. Well, I'm happy to invite you um, to, to one of the more extraordinary nights. Um, and so happy to introduce you to Maria Kuznetsova, who was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and moved to the US as a child. Her first novel, Oksana Behave, was published in 2019. She lives in Auburn, Alabama, with her husband and daughter, where she's an assistant professor of creative writing at Auburn University. She's also a fiction editor at the Bear Life Review, a journal of immigrant and refugee literature. And joining her tonight is Anton Desclafani, who is the author of two novels, The Yanalasi Writing Camp for Girls and The After Party. Both books were Amazon Best Books of the Month and Indie Next Picks and have been translated into over a dozen languages. Her short fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Guernica, American Short Fiction, Narrative, and the New York Times. And she is also a professor at Auburn University. They're so lucky. Um, and so Maria, would you like to start us off with a short reading? Yes, um, thank you so much, Maris, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I feel like I should be talking about my syllabus right now and not my novel, but here we are. So um, thank you to McNally Jackson. I actually did my Oksana Behave book launch in person there just about two years ago um, in Brooklyn. So uh, I wish you know we could all do this together in person, but support your indies, they're awesome. Um, thanks everyone, family and friends for being here. And now um, thanks to Anton especially. And I'm gonna read a little bit from my novel, something unbelievable, here it is. Um, I'm gonna read for about five minutes and I tried to pick a part that doesn't require a lot of explanation. Um, it's about a 30 something actress and mom who puts on a play based on her grandmother's World War II story, it alternates from the grandmother and granddaughter's points of view. And this is a grandmother section. Uh, her name is Larissa, it's 1941. She's 14, we're in Kiev, Ukraine, and the Germans have just invaded and her family is evacuating. Okay. My family stood in our courtyard in the early morning with our suitcases, waiting for the Orlov's car to take us to the station while my sister scurried around like a maniac, trying to summon her beloved stray cat, Timofey. The night before she cried madly when parting with the three vapid, indistinguishable brunette friends I called the three Annas had a prolonged goodbye with Stella and Ella, the mother and daughter who lived in their room to our left and put makeup on her face when mama wasn't looking, wept when saying farewell to our groundskeeper, Maxime, and she even shed a tear when Aunt Mila and Uncle Igor Chernak, the cranky retired engineers in the room to our right, gave us marmalades as a parting gift. But these goodbyes were not enough for Polina. She would not feel complete if she did not see her mangy black cat, a foul creature who regularly stalked our balcony in hopes of her lavishing him with love and milk. Like many of the world's common fools, Polina had a soft spot for animals, though she could hardly be bothered to be polite to her own sister. Where did you go, my sweetness? My sister cried into the void, madly waving an old bread pressed as bait. Just a hint of pink and purple bled through the dark sky. 
The Orloff's car had arrived at last, followed by a car containing the Orloff family. I did not realize a black Maria would be coming. This made our journey feel even more official and solemn. Still, my heart fluttered at the notion that Misha Orloff, the older son, was right there, waiting in the shadows. I heard the pitter-patter of my sister's faithful cat just as the car's headlights flooded our courtyard. Polina lurched toward her creature while Mama grabbed her by the scruff of her neck like she herself was a wayward kitten. Hurry up, silly girl. If we miss this train, there will be no other, she said. But Poya gave Papa an irresistible look and he nodded and lifted a hand. My sister smiled weakly and crouched down toward the vile, stinky thing. Good boy, Poya said, letting him lap the bread crust out of her hand as she stroked his fur. You'll always be my good boy, won't you? Unbelievable, muttered Baba Tonya as she adjusted her boa. She was Poya's ally about all things except Timofei. She, like me, did not care for animals. It might have been the only thing we agreed on. Really, Fede Mama said, shaking her head at my father, but she did not chastise my sister again. You'll have to be good without me now. Can you do that? My sister told the creature. He can't talk, I snapped, but she ignored me. The engines of the Black Marias hummed loudly. Uncle Constantine stepped out of the passenger seat and lifted a hand in our direction. Even his silhouette was formidable. Papa opened his mouth to tell Poya it was time to go, but she got up on her own, turned around, and put on her best version of a brave face, like she was some big hero for leaving a stray behind. I could have put up an equal fuss over the shelf of books I was forced to leave, but did I let my lip tremble like a baby's due to our family's unknowable circumstances? Of course not, his eye was grown. We gave our bags to a stone-faced driver and the women crammed in the back while Papa sat in the front. The loaf car pulled away and ours followed suit. I could just make out the cat's yellow eyes against the last vestiges of darkness, and my sister put her hand to the other window. I could hardly breathe in the stuffy car, but I tried to carve out a sanctified space from which to gaze out and say goodbye to my beloved city. As the car pulled away, I looked up at her balcony one last time, a place where Papa and I would chat in the evenings, where I would read on warm summer days. There was no time for a proper farewell. Our car would not drive languidly along the banks of the Nipuroa, passing the gold dome lava and the beaches of my youth, the endless parks, chestnut trees, and green hills. We lived just two kilometers from the station. In fact, our apartment was only a few blocks from the tracks that ran up and down our city, and every hour we would hear the screech of the train and feel our apartment tremble as it roared by. The noise was a comfort in a way. We drove through Zhilyansky Street, past rows of tan apartment buildings nearly identical to our own. Normally the street was not particularly crowded, but that morning it was packed and we moved slowly. Don't worry, dear, said Mama. The Institute will put us, oops, will put us, will give us a decent home and keep us fed and you girls will still go to school, she reminded us. The last part was a relief to me, but it made Poya choke a little bit. We shouldn't be gone too long, Papa added from the front seat. He did not turn around to look us in the eye to emphasize his point. We will return before you know it, Mama said, but I knew she was bluffing. The night before, I saw her sneak her winter clothes into her suitcase and understood that it would not be a quick jaunt. It'll be far safer out there than here, Mama said. It is the best way. It is a privilege to be able to leave. It is our patriotic duty, Papa added, but this did not take. But what about my friends, Poya cried. What'll happen to my friends? Your friends will forget about you in no time, I offered, which was my best effort to distract her. Easy for you to say, you don't have any, she said. I yanked her hair and watched her bottom lip tremble again, and it was true. I had no friends to my name, but I had my books, my city, and my beloved literature teacher, Marina Igorevna, who was always sneaking me books the way Polina snuck scraps of food to old Timofei. While my sister loved caring for Timofei, she also thrived on the attention she received from her friends and the endless stream of slightly older boys who walked her to school. The mama made sure that they did nothing more. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks for listening. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having us, Maris and McNally Jackson. Um, so uh, my name is Andy Disclavani, as Maris said, and I'm going to be asking Maria some questions. Please um, let us know if you have any questions, just type them in the chat box and I will be, maybe after we talk for 20 minutes or so, I'll look at the, at the chat and, um, ask some questions of Maria. So congratulations on your New York Times review, first of all. I was up very early this morning and I saw it at like 4.30 a.m. 
and I texted Maria <laughs> and I was like, oops, I'm sorry, you're probably still asleep. Um, but it was, it was a very exciting thing to see so early in the morning. Good um, way to wake up. Pardon? It's a good text to receive, you know? <laughs> you said you thought it was a dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is the beautiful book. Um, so to give, you already did this, but to, to give readers a little background, because I'm assuming that most people haven't read it in, you know, the 12 hours it's been out. Um, the book opens in a modern day setting. It opens in New Jersey in a one bedroom apartment. And we meet um, Natasha, who has just given birth. She has a, an infant that she's caring for. And then um, we meet her grandmother, Larissa, who is living in Kiev, Ukraine, and um, they Skype with each other. They have a very close relationship um, and they are Skyping with each other. And so the rest of the novel is watching these two stories or reading these two stories unfold, one very new story and one very old story. And the old story, um, it, as, and Maria read the, the beginning of that um, and it's a really beautiful story. And it's about um, Larissa and her family escaping the Nazis. So my first question is, what was it like to write two settings like that? One incredibly contemporary with Skype, over Skype, and then um, one very historical. That's a good question. Yeah, you know, I think in, in writing it, I feel like the historical part was a lot easier because um, it's kind of based on my grandmother's evacuation from the war and certain things in her story really did happen. Like, um, you know, she had to hide under a train when the Germans bombed the train and they really almost starved to death. And there was a cholera outbreak and all these crazy things. So I had them as kind of touch points. Um, and the contemporary part, which is like my struggle as a contemporary immigrant writer is like trying to make people care about, you know, just a, an actress struggling in her thirties with a baby and trying to make that feel as important as the the more urgent war story where people died and stuff. But in rereading my book, which, um, you know, I only got to hold it in my hands a few weeks ago myself. So I reread it, uh, which was fun. Um, and I thought like, I actually enjoyed reading the more contemporary parts more in a way. Um, now having it like all set, it felt more more natural the way it flowed in a way. So I guess I have I have conflicting feelings about writing the old and the new. And that's why the book is a mix of, of both and hopefully shows that conflict. <laughs> you there. Oh, sorry. I think I muted myself and then could unmute myself. Sorry. I won't do that again. Um, well, it, it, I think that it, um, one of the things that was so moving about it is that it, the, or so interesting and moving about it was that the, um, the voice throughout felt very contemporary. I mean, there was nothing kind of um, old fashioned about Larissa's voice. Like she felt like a, a very modern heroine. Um, and I, I mean, that's interesting. Could you talk a little bit more about how it was your grandmother's story? Like what parts you kind of took from your grandmother and if it was over Skype that you did that? Yeah, yes, yeah, so it was not over Skype, which was a, a pandemic coincidence that a lot of this book is told over Skype. Uh, and um, it was, you know, she immigrated to America with my family in 1991 and then moved back um, when I was, you know, 15 years later when I was in college to retire back in Kiev, Ukraine. And so when I went back there for the first time uh, is when I got reinterested in where I came from and my heritage and started asking all those, those questions. Uh, and I don't think that she ever sat down at one time and like told me the whole story, at least not in my eyes. I think I just remember walking with her as we often did she would always make me uh, walk too far, even though I was tired and she would stop and smoke and then we would keep walking and walking. Uh, and during that time, she would, you know, reveal this little bit or that little bit. Um, and then I think at some point I might've asked her, but, um, you know, she passed away five years ago and I wasn't writing the story then, you know, so I never, um, her sister is still alive and is, um, uh, does Skype my family. And so I asked her for the story at some point, um, yeah. Yeah, but a lot, yeah, but it's you know my grandma was five and uh, Larissa's fourteen and there's a love triangle, there's a rivalry with her sister. There are things that um, made it more contemporary, I think, or more engaging than reading about a five-year-old, you know, suffering through the war. I think so. All that <laughs> love intrigue stuff was was made up. Uh, yeah, I mean that was one of my questions um, was whether or not you predicted the pandemic. 
with <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> it just felt like so i mean oh, we're gonna switch skype with zoom and we're you know. now we're just talking about it over zoom yes i mean <laughs> um that is ploy. pardon it was, all, it was all marketing ploy you know <laughs> you, you like you could tell that you could predict the future um i was I, I found the descriptions of new motherhood and this, is, I mean, some of it was from Larissa's point of view when she gives birth to her son, but mainly it's from um, Natasha's point of view. Her descriptions of new motherhood are um, hilarious and often revelatory. And I mean, the infant for um, the, the infant Talia is described as rat faced several times um, later in the book, she's described as a gooey alien and I was wondering if you could talk about writing um, uh, the character of a mother who is not instantly in love with her offspring. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I, the Times Review, like all the quotes it pulled was about how ugly the baby was. There was like four of them, like great. <laughs> awesome. I wrote other stuff too in there. Um, yeah, you know, I, um, I, so I wrote the Larissa story first, and then at some point I realized it was, it felt like a novella to me. It didn't feel like a full novel. And I just had the frame of her granddaughter receiving it. So I um, I then added that second point of view when my daughter was born. So right around that time, uh, I actually didn't have, I had many other postpartum issues. Uh, I did not have the issue of not, you know, falling in love with my child right away, but I try to picture um, this character who uh, is an actress and who, you know, unlike writers, her, her body and her physical, appearance and well-being is really much more, you know, really important to her landing roles and stuff. And I try to picture um, kind of what her day-to-day -day was like. And um, it became pretty clear to me that she was kind of ambivalent about, like she, you know, was this rebel in her community. She was the artistic one in this immigrant uh, Russian Jewish community um, and didn't think she would be married, didn't really think she'd have a kid. And all of a sudden this was happening to her and she, um, you know, it, 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 and I think to me, I mean, I don't really believe in spoilers, but I, I, I was talking to um, a friend of mine about the book uh, for an interview and I was kind of realizing like the, the love story to me in the book is like, the, it's about between all the women in the book and like one of them is between Natasha and her child. Like to me, the arc of her falling in love with her own child is more important than whatever men are in the way, you know? Um, yeah, so those parts, yeah, they, I, I kind of, Wrote, wrote it second and then the challenge was getting them to kind of mesh and figuring out like separating it into four parts and who should talk when and like passing the point of view baton and and all those things um so larissa came first her story came first and then natasha's mm -hmm. oh that's yeah. so interesting and wh where did the um when you conceived of natasha did the did um did the play come with her immediately yeah originally so it was for um a 50 year story class at the Iowa Writers Workshop where we had to write a story that take place over 50 years. And I wanted to tell this three year war story. So I was like, aha, let's add a frame of a granddaughter and make it 50 years later to, you know, uh, cheat a little bit. And so it had that frame of her kind of putting on the play that was there all along, but I don't really conceive her as, of, of her as like a full person. She was more receiving the story. And I think, you know, there's a lot of stories um, that I love about you know old people passing down a story, but I feel like it's it's very much um, the young person is receiving it and getting wisdom, and the old person you know dies off. And I think in this book, I wanted them both to kind of gain something from it, but to show that, I needed Natasha to be like a flesh, fleshed out human who is there to give the story more meaning. Yeah, I mean she's definitely fleshed out, and I think that that's one of the reasons that the it's so moving is that she is not your typical kind of recipient of, of an older person's wisdom. You know, like they're, they're real, that she's so close to her grandmother is, is surprising in some ways because she seems like she has other interests and um, her grandmother is kind of mean to her. <laughs> I mean, mean to her in a loving way, but she, you know, it, she calls her baby rat based, etc. Um, I don't know if she actually calls her that to Natasha, but um, can you explain like their closeness and how you, how you made them so close on the page? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, tough love. It's the Soviet way. Um, I, <laughs> you know, he, uh, and, and, you know, in a lot of, in, in Oksana behave too, yeah, I tend to kill off the parents because they, they take up too much of a psychic space yes. in my life and in, in my books. Um, and uh, I think in, in this book, so Natasha, her parent, you know, her mother is this person who passed away when she was young and she's constantly thinking of her own mom and her own mom's kind of 
their lack of closeness and her mom's artistic ambitions she didn't really know about until it was too late and um and so i i you know they the grandmas are only tied to the world to her like genetic lifeline um her her grandfather passed away recently who she was also close with so um, yeah, so her grandma's kind of it for her and Natasha's kind of it for her grandma. So part of it, I think, I mean, they're always close, but part of the bond is that there's there's no one left. And then the other piece of that is that uh, Larissa and Natasha used to spend the summers together on the sea and it was a special time where they would have fun, but also they would both hook up. You know, Larissa would, would, she, would yeah. cheat on her, her husband with a bunch of men and Natasha would, you know, eventually meet some some Ukrainian lifeguards and you know go for it and and as the story goes on Larissa is increasingly uh, feels guilty that Natasha must have realized what was going on during those summers uh, which still are hold kind of this special place in both their hearts yeah I mean that was the th that was um you could feel how close they were on and how much they understood each other like there there's a gap between them I mean um Larissa's parents or sorry Natasha's parents are are both dead by the time the book opens um but her grandmother understands her even though she's from a very very different world um her grandmother understands her much better it seems like than her parents ever did um and that like that was um I was thinking about Oksana when I was reading this book and I, and and your narrators um and Natasha she's around the same age as Oksana. No, well, Oksana starts younger, but they're both young women. And then Larissa. And I mean, the, the reason, or one of the things that I really like about your narrators is that none of them um, are easy narrators. Um, none of, they're all funny and bitter and sarcastic, and they all do things that we wish they wouldn't. And they kind of constantly do that. Um, but they, and they're also all narrators that make things happen as opposed to things happening to them. Like Larissa makes things happen during the war parts, even though there's this great big war happening to her and happening to her family. And so I was wondering about, about that, how you, um, how you write narrators that have such force. How do I write really likable characters? <laughs> I, mean, I didn't want to use the words unlikable because I'm going beyond that, but I mean, how, um, oh, you know, narrators. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and it's funny because when I write these things, I don't really think of them as as you know, unlikable or this and that. And then the reviews are like, "This person sucked," and I'm like, "Oh, but that was like, I, I didn't. It was based on me." Okay, uh, you know, but no, but seriously, I think uh, you know, Ethan Keenan, my teacher, said like all stories start with bad behavior, and I think and that bad behavior can be like, you know, stealing a pocket watch or having an affair. It doesn't have to be, you know, that major. But I think um, when I'm, you know, plotting stuff or imagining my characters. I just want them to make stuff happen. And then my goal is to figure out like what comes next or how how that'll reverberate. Um, you know, like, I mean, I guess spoilers, but like things surrounding the necklace that the grandmother, you know, uh, that Larissa's grandmother has has lost, you know, like um, I think I think part of the fun is just throwing people into the world and like seeing what what mischief they could make and then what sense the people around them could make of it. Um, yeah, and they, I mean, for what it's worth, they never seem unlikable <laughs> to me. I mean, they seem very human, and they like give in to their impulses sometimes, but they don't. I mean, they definitely don't seem unlikable. And I, mean, I think that sometimes historical fiction can get a bad rap because it feels like um, things are happening to characters, especially to women. And mm -hmm. that is like that. That does not happen in your book. Like, definitely, there are circumstances that happen to Larissa, but then Larissa is her own singular character within these circumstances, which I think is a, um, which is, um, which made the. I mean, they were they definitely felt historical. I mean, they were set in a in a different time, but it also, um, it 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 felt like history was serving the character and not the other way around. If that makes sense. Yeah, that's that's not really a question, yeah. but. <laughs> In your books too, the characters, you know, do their own thing and don't just <laughs> in history. But but yeah, I think Larissa, you know, after the war ended and she married uh, her husband, that was her feeling like stuff was just happening to her. Like he proposed to her on the train and and she kind of just said yes, even though the way he said it was, you know, like, I think you will make a great wife. And she's like, okay. And then uh, I think when she starts making stuff happen is when she has affairs and tries to like seek her own happiness, but that comes at a cost as well. So I think yeah, kind of, yeah, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm not like an expert on historical fiction. Uh, so I think I try to like 
the historical parts, I tried to almost envision them, though Larissa is telling them, uh, as if Natasha was thinking about them, if that makes sense. As oh, like, that 100% makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, how would the contemporary character look at that, even if it's being told by the older Because, character? like, usually scenes with Nazis aren't funny. <laughs> like, and this, there's, like, a lot of humor in this. Like, you, like there, I mean, not that the, I mean, it, like, obviously the, the serious things are treated with reverence, but there's also a lot of humor within. And, I mean, it seemed like that was a way that they dealt with things, or that was a way that Larissa dealt with things. Um, but that, that makes a lot of sense that you were thinking, like, that we were kind of getting it through Natasha's point of view. Um, I, and this is, like, maybe my last question about history but it's something I'm interested in, historical fiction. Um, I was thinking a lot about um, Angela Carter's short story about uh, the Fall River Axe murders about Lizzie Borden. And she has, a, I can't remember the same, the exact line, but a line about how um, we can never revisit the, the horrors of the past, the physical horrors. And you like, you concentrate, um, so much on kind of the granular de physical details of the past. Like there's this, um, and I, I'm not giving anything away, but the, the characters are starving and Larissa's sister, Polya, is that how you say her name? Polya, it's fine. Polya, okay. <laughs> I have a bunch of one of them. Um, is her, her mother ties twine around her forearms um, because to keep, she called, to keep her arm meat in place so that her skin doesn't sag at her at her wrists and um and there are many other details about starvation and um what they do to stave off starvation and the, the filth and i was wondering um what where did you get all this how did you research that and and how did how did you figure out where to put it in yeah it's a good question so yeah the army was true that's something my grandma told me uh that really happened to her which is so horrifying that like i i mean i don't know um, she also liked to exaggerate, so it's also hard to know, uh, you know, um, well, but I'm sure that did happen. And I think with the, the you know, I, I mean, I read, I tried to read like um, Svidlana Alexievich, the, the, you know, recent Nobel Prize winner. Um, she has an oral history called The Last Witnesses of like the children of the war. Um, and so I tried to read stuff like in that era just to make sure I wasn't like totally off and to get some of the physical descriptions. And then, um, and, you know, I asked her sister more questions. I asked my family questions. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was kind of in my imagination. And I think that the struggle for me was like, is am I even allowed to write like a love triangle in the war? I mean, I guess people do it, but it felt like people were, you know, completely miserable. Um, but there was like a relative. What started even any love plot was that there there was not in my family, but there was a guy in the mountains with them who like really would, he was a teenage boy, would run off and like have flings with women and they would give him food and then he would hoard it. And like that to me showed like there were people like fooling around out there, you know, things were going on, um, you know, peace or war. And so I just tried to, um, you know, add the hunger and the, the hard parts when necessary while having, you know, having the people still want things beyond food, I think. And so, you know, and that's where like the magical thinking comes in where like hope my readers are okay with that like that they are trying to meet other needs uh for the sake of the novel you know yeah i mean no <laughs> it, i mean it made them seem very human like yeah um so this is a kind of big leap in topic and without giving anything away, can you explain the cats? <laughs> can you talk about the cats in the book? <laughs> and you have there are two cats. There is a cat in the modern day setting. And then there, who has a very funny, um, vulgar habit. And then there's a cat in the in the um, in the war setting. Um, and without, I mean, I did, you probably can't talk too much about it because you don't want to give things away. But like, why cats? And um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. You know, I love cats. I have a cat. And as I was reading for my book, I'm like, I hope people don't think I hate cats. Um, you know, I wrote, uh, so t today I, I wrote an um, essay in Lit Hub that talked about the two books I wrote that weren't published and what I learned from them before publishing two books. Uh, and one of them had uh, this character called Reginald, the self relating cat. Um, and I just, I, I promised myself I might scrap this 900 page book, but Reginald will have, have his day. Uh, and so, so, you know, so I put him in Natasha's apartment and I just, I love the idea of this cat just, you know, doing this to himself uh, while she's trying to like answer these serious existential questions. And there's a point at the end when she and the grandma are just like, let him do it. Like, at least he's having fun, you know, like while they're trying to figure out their lives, like, why not? Um, 
So I don't know. So he just felt like he fit in this space that was like serious and stressful and filled with like question, existential questions of career, love, family. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the, the past cat, well, we had little Timofey. So Folio was kind of set up as a cat lover. Yeah. And so I don't really know why that happened, but then I kind of went with it. And then I thought like, there should be a cat in the mountains. He should be super important to her and something horrible should happen to him. And then, and then, and then it set off a chain of events that led to uh, a death, you know? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. It just kind of, it kind of, I just kind of followed it and I went with it and it seemed to take me it seemed to lead to some plot, so. It definitely led to plot, um, and it was, I mean, I, I feel like sometimes when animals are in books, they're, I don't know, they're, they're like setting, like they don't really play important parts in the book, um, but the, I mean, the, 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 is it Licky in the? Oh, yeah. Yes, Licky. <laughs> he, I mean, he definitely plays an important part, and then the, um, what is the modern day cat's name? Um, what is Shadi? Yeah, static. He um, it, he does that. Like I, he was comic relief, but he also like does that thing that animals do that reminding you, that reminding you that you're, you know, you're you're mortal. <laughs> you could be having a really bad day, and your dog is like, you know, um, chasing his tail in the background, or um, so it like it felt like a, a realistic way to write animals, <laughs> and, and funny. Um, so. Um, I was in, so the the as we've talked about the book covers some pretty terrible or pretty um, sad subject matter, and yet it always it always manages to be funny, and sometimes uncomfortably funny when you're laughing in a moment where you um that's sad, but then it also feels like the moment can be both like the moment can be sad and funny and and it it seems um like a real achievement to get a reader to feel that. And um, I was wondering if you could talk about what it's like to to write funny moments. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm teaching this um, humor grad class, and we read like Kurt Vonnegut and the books that are currently propping up my computer in this office. Uh, uh, my sister, the serial killer, the convenience store woman, yeah. um, committee members. You know, and then kind of I thought that through the class I would have this great thesis of like how to write funny stuff, but it's more just like wasn't that funny? That's funny too. Let's look at this other funny thing. You know, so I think um, what, I mean, I think the funniest moments are also sad and the saddest moments are also funny. And if you could, you know, toe that line in one sentence, like it's a tightrope where if you fall too much into sad, then it's melodramatic. If you fall too much into funny, then uh, it's hard to see the heart, you know, underneath. So, um, yeah, so when I'm writing, I think it just kind of when I feel myself veering too much into sentimentality, then I kind of course correct and go into, you know, the funnier stuff. And when I feel like it's feels too sitcom -y, like a lot of the contemporary stuff with Natasha, there's a lot of like witty banter that I cut because it wasn't, you know, really pushing the story for it. There's still left some maybe, uh, but, you know, just trying to keep keep that balance. Um, yeah, I mean, they were really, I mean, they were <laughs> um, the banter was hilarious Natasha and the president and with the with her the friends that she's not really friends with and her Instagram posts and like being jealous of the baby for getting more likes on Instagram than she gets um so we have a question yes um so Angie would like to know if you could talk about um the cover image and um how you settled on this one and if it points in what images it points to or what key images ideas it points to in the book Angie, yeah, here's the cover. Um, we've got a necklace and then a mountain and a train and it's orange. And I think that's that's the main, what you need to know. Um, yeah, over the summer, you know, I got, and I think Anton, you saw too, I got my cover options and one was the frying pan killing a dead animal, which, you know, is I think it's more my my aesthetic is that like just uh we are more frying pan dead animal. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, thought, I thought let's let's kind of um try to at least make the book look a little a little more more serious or more I don't know fun series instead of just like dead animal which might you know like my first book cover had a middle finger on it so I thought that was cool but let's let's not have a back-to-back -back middle finger and dead animal let's let's try this and I think it um but I, I you know and I love the cover and I think it the the necklace um is a very important kind of plot point in the story that it gets passed down from the eight different generations of women and it ends with Natasha receiving it, spoiler alert. Um, and so I thought that felt right for the cover. And then I just, you know, I just loved kind of, um, just you can look through it and see that there's some kind of a story happening. 
Um, and then the colors are still bright and loud, so they suggest that it's not just like a, a serious war story. It's a fun one, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> war story. I know. <laughs> that should be the blurb on the cover. A fun war story. Uh, um, yeah, but it was, you know, it's never, I don't know, it, those decisions are so, like, it feels like it's what you feel that week, and then that's your book cover, but I'm very, very happy with it. Yeah, I mean, it does also look, um, like, I feel like you get the sense that it's a story, that parts of it are historical, mm -hmm. with, the, with the train, you know, yeah. like, it's not, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so we have a question from Chelsea. Um, you said something about how the modern day storyline was just a frame and then became a full-fledged character story. Could you say more about how you came to realize that part of the book should be more than a frame and more of a fully developed character? What point at the in the writing process did that happen? Yeah, you know, I had drinks with my husband and he said, you need a second point of view. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's, he's not even here. He's watching our kid. But he, uh, he you know, so he kind of said, um, I know you're stuck on this war part and it doesn't feel like it's a full book and like uh, you should have some kind of contemporary character uh, figuring this thing out. It'll make the book feel more dynamic. Um, so I was like, yeah, I mean, I was already thinking about it. So I shouldn't say he came up with it. I asked him if I should do it or something like that. And then he said like, absolutely, yes. And then, um, so it was just, you know, like, I don't know, maybe a year, it was two summers ago or something. And then, and then, um, but then I started writing it and then it didn't feel right. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it felt, well, first it was in the third person because I don't know why, but I started writing about it in the third person because I felt like, um, though on the surface, she's very similar to me. Um, one would say, I think she's really different from me in the way that she thinks about the world and other people and herself and her life. And so I just, I felt like I couldn't get in into her head. Um, so I wrote a draft in like third person and then I was like, okay no this is weird and then why do I have a book that's first person and then third person which is done but it just didn't feel like I was close enough to her um and then I just and then at some point a few months later I think I was like oh actually like when I started seeing um how they bounce back and forth and how like I would have a new section that would be Natasha then passing it to Larissa like it, it gave the book more energy that it didn't have when it was just like 100 pages of war and like no you know, no break from it, I guess. Like, I think the reader needs a break, like Natasha needs a break um, and I need a break. <laughs> what, how, I mean, um, how did you, like, she seems to, Natasha has so fully inhabited the world of being an actress mm -hmm. and go, she goes on auditions. She has, um, before the book, before she has her baby, she has um, a, a job. Um, doing voiceovers in the back of the Americans in Russian, which I love that part. But like, and so it was um, like, so you see like the mythology of, of Russians a, a, in, in present day America, a, you know, versus like what actually happened in the war. Um, how, how did you research that? Like, how did you research kind of all the ins and outs of the theater business and TV, et cetera? Yeah, you know, it was, um, yeah, my friend Masha King, who's here, uh, it was kind of, you know, she, uh, one of my best friends is an actress who uh, is, it reads for the Natasha parts in the audiobook, so, um, which is so cool. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, based on hearing kind of what her life was like, and then I met her one or two auditions, I think there's one that stands out where there was just like, like, to me, like 500, like, pretty brunettes you know, Masha was the prettiest, but it just felt so like you just walk in there, you know, and I was like, how can you do this with your life? Like, it seems so stressful. And so, like with writing your rejection happens over email and it's whatever <laughs> place you, 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 know, you show up and then people look at you and they're like, no, like you suck, you know, I mean, not that's, you know, but literally like, um, so I started envisioning like if, if all the kind of anxieties and fears and stuff about our art, like, uh, you know, what happened to an actress and it just seemed like way worse. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like the, the embodied aspect of it and the risks you take to do it and um, the effort it takes to audition and how motherhood makes that. I mean, obviously motherhood makes writing harder too, but it, like you can hide away in your office, you know, for an hour or something if you really can't, but with acting, it's not like I'm gonna go, you know, be in a show for a few months or whatever, or, or go audition, you know, three hours away or something. So, um, so I think it was, it was, yeah, I can't say. I think I would ask Masha hopefully a few things. Like we went to a party where some guys were talking about um, doing, 
you know, doing voiceovers for for the Americans or something, or doing voice, or or I think he was he was Chinese. He's talking about doing it for you know a Chinese whatever the background of what what it would sound like in the eighties, um, you know. And I was like, they do like they pay you to do that, you know? And he said, yeah, actually, it pays pretty well. You have to give realistic background, you know, correct language noise, and they tell you what words you can't say because they're not contemporary and or they're too contemporary. And I just found that so weird and in this weird way to look at your um, you know, like as an immigrant writer, I think about like, am I selling myself out by putting like a Russian doll on my book cover? Like, is that really who I am? Or is that just what the world thinks an immigrant writer should, you know, look like? And I think with with art, like, or with, uh, you know, Natasha's character, like taking on these Russian prostitute roles and stuff, which are always people who are named Natasha anyway, uh, you know, I think there's like, some of those questions also come into play. It's like, yeah, that yeah. That's fascinating. Um, Andrea has a question. Were you inspired by other Russian novels? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Andrea. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, the, the Free World by David Bismozgis, um, who's like an amazing writer. He's one of my favorites. Um, he's so good. He wrote a book called Natasha and Other Stories. Uh, but the, his second novel, yeah, it was the second. The Free World is about um, a family who um, immigrated to the United States or to Canada through Rome. And it's kind of about many characters in the same um, family who live in Rome for like six months where like a bunch of crazy stuff happens. There's an affair. A lot of things are put to a breaking point. Someone dies. Um, and it actually for my, my MFA thesis at Iowa, like I wrote about um, how do you juggle so many characters and so many points of view. Uh, so I did Dr. Shivago in the free world. And I kind of looked at these books that had, I mean, Dr. Shivago has like, like 10 or something point of views and different time periods, history. And I kind of just looked at like, how do you cram them all in one place? And then how do you pass that baton of point of view? And like, how do you keep the plot going? So I think those two books, um, were, were on my mind for sure. And then, you know, Sergei Devlatov uh, is always just um, a favorite of mine on, on a sentence level. He, I think, um, and Kervonaga, but I, yeah, I think those two, wow, four men, good good job, Maria. Uh, you know, <laughs> four white men, here we are. You missed um, a woman earlier. So oh, I did somewhere. Yeah, so, you know, they, I think they really, um, yeah, uh, Julie Schumacher, there you go. Uh, you know, people who on a sentence level, I think, inspired this book, where I try to look at how to, um, you know, get at the funny and the, the, like, extremely, like, tragic in one sentence. And, you know, Russian writing is, is full of that, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then the characters are reading Russian literature. Yes. Um, throughout, <laughs> the, yes. Th throughout the book. Um, how was I mean it, I think the title is perfect did you know that the title this would always be the title or did you decide on it afterwards no it was later yeah it was um I'm trying to think I think I called it the station just for lack of anything better it was kind of a working title because there's a lot of trains stations in the book both in the present and the past um and then something unbelievable you know it was something my grandmother actually said uh you know she, she would say everything was either something unbelievable which was good or something awful which was very bad and so she like, it was something awful, which I just, so, you know, uh, it was something that me and my husband would say a lot because it's hilarious. And so at some point I kind of um, had no title and then I was thinking, you know, it was a thing she already said in the book. And I thought it both captured her kind of awe at life. And then the books, you know, attempted awe at life that it is kind of, um, mm -hmm. that is kind of unbelievable that all these people, you know, eight generations of women and this, 89 year old woman and 37 year old across the world are connected. Like that is, there's kind of a wonder to that. Um, and I think it like hints at hopefully the somewhat fun nature of the book too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, this is, oh, this is also a little bit of a departure. Uh, oh wait, Amaris, are we done? We're not we done. I just wanted to come back. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. one more question. Um, so you are writing um, about Russians and Russian immigrants, and now you are a writer who is living in the Deep South. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. How is that to to um, live in Auburn, Alabama? Yeah, well, why don't you tell us, Anson? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I think about. I want somebody else's you perspective. Can, you can see, I think, if I don't mess this up, you can see that football stadium. Yeah. This is the view for my, my office in the English department, which is amazing. Um, you know, I mean, I've kind of, I've lived all over. So my family, you know, moved to New Jersey when we immigrated, but then we lived in Florida for a few years. So my family's kind of, my first like memory of real immigrant stuff was in Florida, Gainesville, which is only, you know, five hours away from here. So I think 
Um, and then I went to college in the South. So some of the, the good parts are, are delightfully familiar. Um, and then some of the other parts, you know, I mean, there's people everywhere, you know, at this point, like I, I, I really don't have don't have anything bad to say. I think um, what I do find is is the students here um, more than any other place where I've taught, like Iowa or California. Uh, they write about place so much. Like they all write about being from the South, what it means to be in the South, the complications of the South, um, and that feels really familiar to me. You know, like being obsessed with where you come from and like investigating the good and the bad of it. So I think yeah, that was a better question than mine. I was trying to <laughs> get it, like a connection between Southern literature and immigrant literature, and like you said it. So. I, I turned around so I didn't have to say anything bad. You know, so I think. Uh, but I found that. Do you find that in your students? Like they're always writing about. Yes. what it means in the south and yeah and i mean if they love the south they write about you know yeah. their love of the south they write about their complicated feelings about the south i mean yeah it's a very place-based a place-based place place-based place -based <laughs> place -based <laughs> of english here we are. Yes. <laughs> well maria anton thank you so much for a really lovely evening and um for the audience please buy the book it sounds so amazing um, let's do this um, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I don't know everyone who's here, but or like I don't know who is here of my friends, but thank you. I really appreciate this. Thank you, Maris. Thank you, McNally Jackson. Thank you, Anton. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.